Set at the tip of the Seward Peninsula and overlooking the Bering Sea, Nome is sitting about 860 kilometers northwest from Lask's largest city of Anchorage, roughly 6,100 kilometers northwest from Washington DC and only about 330 kilometers east of Russia. This means Nome is one of the most remote settlements in Alaska and it is not serviced by the Alaskan highway system, so it can only be reached by air or water or potentially snowmobiles and dog sleds. While today it is a small city with less than 4,000 residents, at one point it was home of the last great gold stampede in the history of the American West. It is also the location where the story of the movie Togo really took place as multiple teams of brave sled dogs and their mushers made an incredible journey to save the lives of Gnome's residents. And allegedly it is the center of alien abductions in USA today. The origin of Nome's name is debated, but the most popular theory is that the name was given by Jafet Lindbergh, as within trekking distance of his childhood home in Norway, there's a place called Nome Dalen. Jafet was a gold prospector and became the co-founder of the city of Nome, as he was one of the trio consisting of Eric Lindblom and John Bryanston, who stumbled upon the rich gold deposits in the area. The three lucky Swedes, as they came to be known, had met in Circle City mining area of Alaska and decided to hunt for gold along its western coast. Their rich findings along Anvil Creek in the fall of 1898 inspired much excitement amongst gold seekers, both in Yukon in Canada and continental US. Amongst the first to arrive were some 8,000 miners already working around Dawson City in Yukon, but by 1899 there were ships full of miners arriving from Seattle, San Francisco and well beyond. Many of the fortune seekers who arrived too late to stake claims along the mouth of the Snake River set up tents on the beach where they made another amazing discovery, that there was gold on the beach. The area became known as poor man's paradise. The beaches had distinct advantages. They could be reached easily by ship and they did not have to haul 2,000 pounds of goods over narrow snowy mountain passes as they did during the Klondike gold rush in Yukon. And most importantly, the beach could not be staked. Everyone was free to search for gold on it. The town exploded into life along its beaches. What had recently been just a prospector's campsite turned into a town of over 20,000 people within the space of just a couple of months. It was transformed into a bustling city filled with congested streets, Hundreds saloons and dozens of stores, restaurants and hotel tents and quickly constructed wooden buildings. In the summer of 1900, Nome reached its peak and was the largest general delivery address in the US postal system. But the population started to decline rapidly after that and from an estimated 20,000 in 1899, it decreased to less than a thousand by the 1920s, by which time most of the easily accessible gold had been long gone. However, the search for gold remained attractive as an avenue to gain wealth for many years to come, especially as the US was dealing with the Great Depression and its lingering after effects between 1929 in 1939, gold mining was the sole income of many Alaskan communities, especially Nome, and became Alaska's second largest industry after salmon fisheries. But the gold industry would come to a sudden decline as massive prosperity came to Alaska in the form of 150,000 troops and millions of dollars spent on military infrastructure of the Second World War. They're blazing a trail for the construction of a 1500 mile military highway from the United States to Alaska. During World War II, Nome was the last stop on the ferry system for planes flying from the United States to the Soviet Union for the land lease program. The land lease policy was formally titled as an act to promote defense of the United States and was a program under which the US supplied the United Kingdom, France, the Republic of China, the Soviet Union and other allied nations with food, oil and materials. Starting in 1941 till the end of the war, so the influx of army personnel along with the creation of new infrastructure required a massive labor force in Alaska which simply wasn't available and this posed a threat to the gold industry as government contractors were capable of paying much more. And the US had just abandoned the gold standard in the early 1930s as well, prohibiting the possession of gold bullion by private citizens. The result was that the metal lost much of its value as a medium of exchange. While in the past the gold industry had been considered vital, that was no longer the case. The government was actively discouraging its mining within the country, instead encouraging miners to fulfill more patriotic duties such as provide help in the construction of war infrastructure. For settlements like Nome, entirely dependent on gold production, this was a disaster and fears abounded that all the Alaskan territories devoted to gold mining would soon be abandoned and Nome would become a ghost town. By 1942, half of the mines in Alaska 
were out of business. And by 1944, gold mining had almost completely been wiped out. It was a major casualty of the war. However, it survived in Nome, and to this day has remained as the town's main source of revenue. By 1925, Nome had greatly diminished from its peak of 20,000 inhabitants during the Gold Rush days, but it was still the largest town in northern Alaska, with 455 Alaska natives and 975 settlers of European descent. The only link to the rest of the world during the winter was the Iditarod Trail, which spans 1,510 kilometers from the port of Seward across several mountain ranges and the vast Alaska interior before reaching Nome. Then, one of the worst things imagined happen. An outbreak began when a doctor diagnosed the first case of diphtheria in a young boy. At the time, diphtheria was called the strangling angel of children because it releases a toxin that shuts down its victim's windpipe. Young children are especially vulnerable to it. The doctors actually had a supply of antitoxin at hand, but it had all expired. Without functioning antitoxin, there was a real danger that the fatality rate for those infected in Nome would be 100%. So Nome's medical team put out a call for help and found out that the nearest supply of antitoxin was in a storehouse outside of Anchorage. A train could bring it closer to Nanana, and then a bush plane could potentially take it from there. But that week in particular, record-setting cold weather and gale force winds swept across Alaska. The only option remaining were sled dogs and their mushers, who would have to deliver the medicine to the city through the storm. 20 teams had to cover the 1,085 kilometer journey to make the delivery, and they did this in 127 and a half hours, which was considered a world record at the time. Done in extreme sub-zero temperatures in near blizzard conditions, the longest part of the relay was covered by Leonhard Zappala with his lead dog Togo and Fritz. They covered over 146 kilometers through some of the roughest terrain. They also risked a 32 kilometer sea ice crossing between Cape Denim and Point Dexter. A statue of Balto, one of the dogs who allegedly finished the race, was unveiled in New York Central Park on December 15. The statue was made to commemorate all the dogs who ran in the Serum race, of whom many perished and sustained injuries. All participants received letters of commendation from the president, Calvin Coolidge, and many other honors. The Serum Run, as it came to be known, helped spur the Kelly Act. This bill allowed private aviation companies to bid on mail delivery contracts to help improve connections between the remotest settlements in Alaska. Also, technology improved within a decade. The last mail delivery by private dog sled under contract took place in 1938, and the last US post office dog sled route closed in 1963. Dog sledding remained popular in the rural interior terrier but became nearly extinct when snowmobiles spread in the 1960s. Mushing, however, was revitalized as a recreational sport in the 1970s with the introduction of the Iditarod dog sled race, which has many traditions that commemorate the serum run. The race is an important and popular sporting event in Alaska, and the top mushers and their teams of dogs are local celebrities. While the yearly field of more than 50 mushers and about 1,000 dogs is still largely Alaskan, competitors from 14 countries have completed the event, including Martin Busser from Switzerland, who became the first foreign winner in 1992. With a year-round population of under 4,000 residents, the small community of Nome isn't known for being a major economic hub or a place that tourists flock to. In fact, what seems to have gotten the most people talking about this isolated community are mysterious disappearances of 24 people between the 1960s and 2004. These all occurred in Nome and throughout its surrounding villages. Initially, many locals were convinced that a serial killer had to be involved due to the large number of people that had gone missing. After all, 24 missing people is a relatively large number for a community of less than 4,000 people. A Hollywood movie called The Fort Kind was released in 2009 and largely told the tale of these disappearances being UFO related. It was later found to be misleading as it was marketed as a documentary and in fact was just a misrepresentation of actual facts surrounding these disappearances. The movie is in essence a conspiracy theory centered around the town. In reality, an above average number of missing people is not only common to known but to Alaska as a whole as the amount of people who go missing in the state is at least double the national average. There's actually a thing called the Alaska Bermuda Triangle, connecting Barrow, Anchorage and Juneau. Since 1988, over 16,000 people have simply gone missing within this triangle, leading to many theories. 
However, the most plausible explanation is simply the vastness of Alaska and its unforgiving wilderness. Getting lost, drowning, getting trapped in the weather, or even getting mauled by bears are all plausible scenarios, leading to many people disappearing without a trace. Not to mention a higher suicide rate and alcoholism, which is part of the package when living in cold, near-Arctic climates. Back in 1900, when the town was created, 95% of the community was white. Today, it's about 50% Alaska native. The history and culture of native people of the Bering Straits goes back thousands of years. And as Nome has evolved as a community, its residents who are the descendants of the gold rush adventurers, Alaska natives and newcomers have all learned from each other to blend old traditions with new. Gold mining in the Bering Sea still brings people to this far corner of the United States in search of higher wages, as the average income of a Nome resident is 30000 a year, while the US average is about 28,500 a year. Added to this, they are also faced with fewer taxes. It's unlikely, however, that this brings a better standard of living to anyone, as all basic living expenses this far north are much higher. However, there is still something wonderful and satisfying about finding new money on the bottom of the ocean, knowing that most of the time, no human has ever before seen it, and that is why Nome is still thriving today, as recreational and small-scale prospecting is still very much a thing, and there is even a complete suit of services that give the people lodging an opportunity to try their luck. So in a sense, they are still making money selling the old shovels. Areas near Fairbanks and Juneau and Nome provide all current gold production as of 2021, and most of the historical output comes from there. The gold rush is still on and most definitely alive in Nome, Alaska. Now, if you enjoyed this video and you want to stay in North America, why not check out my video None of It? Now leave a comment for the algorithm by guessing where this footage was taken and I'll see you soon. Geoperspective out.